the assassination of civil rights icon Malcolm X had their convictions thrown out. Mohammed A. Aziz and Khalil Islam spent more than 20 years in prison for the 1965 murder. Islam was released in 1987 and always maintained his innocence until his death in 2009. The exonerations came after a 22-month investigation conducted by the Manhattan District Attorney's Office and the lawyers for the two men. It revealed that prosecutors on the case, as well as the FBI and the NYPD, withheld key evidence that could have led to the men's acquittal. Here's what Aziz had to say after his exoneration. I am very glad that my family, my friends, and the attorneys who have worked and supported me over these years are finally seeing the truth that we have all known, officially recognized. I hope the same system that was responsible for this travesty of justice also takes responsibility for the immeasurable harm caused to me during the last 55 the men were both victims of the type of discrimination and injustice that Malcolm X strongly denounced as part of his legacy. Joining me tonight to, discuss, to, to talk about all of this, Rachel Dretzen, director and executive producer for the Netflix documentary Who Killed Malcolm X, Shayla Harris, a producer who also worked on that Netflix documentary, Tamara Payne, co-author of The Dead Are Arising, The Life of Malcolm X. She wrote that Pulitzer Prize winning book along with her father, along with her late father, Les Payne. And here with me in studio, Ryan Riley, senior justice reporter for HuffPost. Thank you all for being here. The book is amazing. The Netflix documentary is amazing. And of course, Ryan, you're amazing too. Um, but I want to start, Rachel, with you because the thing that really sticks with me is how in the world did this go so wrong? And really, what went into those exonerations? How did this happen? Well, I mean, it, the incredible thing is that this evidence has been sitting in plain sight, hiding in plain sight, I guess I should say, for, for many, many decades. And it really was just about connecting the dots, um, not only for us to connect the dots, but you know, for um, Les Payne, who connected the dots brilliantly in his book, and for Manning Marable, who published a biography of Malcolm X um, years ago, um, which alleged that the shotgun assassin um, was still at large and pointed to the possibility that these two um, men, Muhammad Aziz and Khalil Azam, were innocent. Um, so, you know, it was really about just doing doing the work, um, unearthing the documents, putting the pieces together, and uh, telling the story. Mm. And I know both you and Shayla were in the courtroom. Rachel, I'll start with you. What was it like to be in that courtroom as these two men were exonerated with, of course, one of them still being alive to witness and experience that moment? It was one of the most extraordinary experiences I've had as a journalist um, and, and as a human being. I mean, it felt... You could feel uh, the tension in the room, the relief in the room, um, being surrounded by the families of these men who've waited for so long for this day, um, and and seeing Mr. Aziz finally get his moment um, in court. It was just amazing. Shayla, what about you? You were there too. How extraordinary was that moment? Yeah, I was actually I was actually unable to get into the courtroom, but. Um, just uh, knowing Aziz and um, and being so involved in the story, it's just an incredible moment, especially as a filmmaker and as a storyteller. It's rare to really um, see firsthand the impact that you can have on both history and on someone's lives, um, and especially um, these two men who have um, maintained their innocence over many, many decades. Um, and so it was a really incredible moment to finally have their names cleared, to have it cleared so publicly, um, and, you know, at the same time, there are still so many questions, um, certainly in um, the key question of who actually killed Malcolm X and whether Malcolm's family will one day have a similar moment of, of justice. What were those other, Shayla, to stick with you, what, were the, what are the other key unanswered questions here, especially when you think about sort of what the FBI might have known, what the NYPD might have known, they had informants in the room. Talk a little bit more about what else there needs to, what else needs to be answered. Well, certainly one of the things that we did um, for the film was sort of dig into the documents. And, and one of the sort of surprising things for me was um, the fact that there were so many informants, both from the FBI and from the NYPD, who were in the room, who were basically witnesses to this crime, who did not testify um, um, to what they saw, what they heard, and what they knew. 
Um, so um, the information that maybe they provided to the FBI um, and their um, superiors um, was certainly something that um, we'd love to know what that information was and, and how that could have impacted the case. Um, one of the key eyewitnesses was uh, an M NYPD informant, Gene Roberts, um, who had been undercover as one of Malcolm's bodyguards, um, and he was not offered up um, as an eyewitness in this case. And so certainly the information that they knew um, and, you know, there's a lot of missing evidence in terms of the murder weapons. And so certainly one of the key questions is that uh, of those documents, there's a lot of redacted material um, in there that could provide some, some key information about who was responsible for this. Um, and certainly efforts to release those documents and um, unredact that, that information would, I think, be key um, to sort of um, understanding what happened on that day. Yeah, and Tamara, I want to come to you. Uh, I know I knew your father. He was an amazing, amazing journalist, as you are yourself. So thank you so much again for being here. Um, I want to. I was going to ask you about Malcolm the Man, which I'm going to do, but because Shayla just mentioned Gene Roberts, talk a little bit about who Gene Roberts is. Talk a bit also about the fact that he might have seen a possible dry run of the assassination, or at least believes he saw that. Uh, take us into exactly who he was. Sure, Gene Roberts was militarily trained and. When he came out of the military and was looking for a job to support his family, his wife in particular, who was pregnant, um, he was looking for a job and he was hired by Bossy to be an informant. And they, his first is to infiltrate Malcolm's Muslims, Muslim Incorporated. And, um, and he described to us, my father and I spoke with him, he described to us exactly what his assignments were. And um, that was, you know, to report what he sees, not what he thinks, not become emotionally involved, but also he, he was supposed to report everything that was supposed to, that he saw and heard what Malcolm's movements were, where, what he was doing, what the plans were, you know, and what uh, who else was coming into the uh, organization, but not to worry about what other agents may be doing. He didn't know who they were. He was only focused on what his assignment was. And But as far as the dry run, um, really key information, very interesting that he was he when he infiltrated the group. He also became part of the security force detail, and he uh, said that on the week before the assassination, Malcolm was giving a speech, and um, there was a disturbance. And the disturbance was somebody coming down the aisle towards the the uh, lecture, and you know, and, and Gene Roberts' response was to go meet, see what this person was up to, and this person just kind of diverted himself into another aisle. But what this was really it seemed to be a test. And he wrote this, he would write reports every week, you know, to say what he saw. And he said, I think I saw a dry run. I think this this is gonna happen. So he and he he sent these reports to his supervisors. Question is, is where are these reports? Yeah. When I looked through the uh, motion today, I didn't see any mention of his reports. Um, I understand that a lot of the bossy reports have been destroyed over the years. Mm. Um, and, and Tamara, sticking with you, talk a bit about Malcolm, the man, who he was, put him in context. We Now we have streets named after him, but at the time, he was seen as a threat, especially by the FBI and law enforcement, as well as the Nation of Islam was, who, of course, he had broken from, but still an organization that was seen as, as a threat as well. Yeah, I mean, when doing this book, the, the Dead Are Arising, you know, one of the things that my father wanted to do was to look at Malcolm and who he was as a person when he sort of started to interview his brothers. And he gets a sense of who Malcolm was and how he grew up and what his relationship was with his siblings and his parents and the lessons that he learned. His mother, Louise, is from Grenada, but her grand, but she was raised by her grandparents who were from Nigeria. His father, Earl Little, was from um, Georgia. And they were members of the UNIA movement, uh, which is the Marcus Garvey organization. And they were organizers. And so they were organizing Black people in communities that they weren't necessarily organized in. Starting in, um, they started out in Philadelphia, moved out to a place like Omaha, where Nebraska, where Malcolm was born. And uh, but in Omaha, Nebraska, as we open our book, they are visited upon by the Ku Klux Klan chapter out there, who are threatened by the movement, what they were doing in town, and they wanted them to leave town. So this is what Malcolm's beginnings are. And but we also have to look at the context of the relate the society that he was born into. You have the Klan coming to his doorstep when his mother's pregnant with him. And this is, you know, this is what we, reality was then and forms of it are continuing even today.
Yeah. And Ryan, I want to bring you in. Tell us a little bit about the FBI operating in the 1960s, targeting black civil rights groups, but also sort of how it connects to present day. We covered Ferguson together, the protests there. And some of the protesters from the Black Lives Matter movement also said that they had contacts and, and felt targeted by the FBI as well. Yeah, actually, last year I covered uh, a Black Lives Matter supporter who actually posed for an album cover. It was a prepared photo um, in front of a police van taken in the daytime. It was obviously a professional shoot. And he got charges because of that. His home was raided because of that instance. Um, and I think that overall, you basically have to realize that this isn't just a historic problem. This is a problem in the modern FBI. The FBI overwhelmingly looks far too much like me. Overwhelmingly, it's white and male, and that's a problem that continues to this day. So even though you have some, you know, a few years ago, uh, former director James Comey started telling uh, all of their first-time uh, special agents during their training that they had to go to the MLK Memorial in D.C. as part of their training. But after that, you know what building they go back to? The J. Edgar Hoover building. It's still named after him today. And I think that that's just sort of astonishing. And when I asked Comey a few years back about when they moved to a new headquarters, if they were going to rename that facility, he didn't want to touch that question. It's still a touchy one for the FBI. It seems sort of nuts that we still have a building named after J. Edgar Hoover in this day and age. Yeah. And Rachel, I want to come back to you. Talk a bit about piecing this inve investigation together. Um, there are so many moments during the documentary where I sort of sit back and say, wow, because you're seeing sort of this investigative journalist, Abdur Raham Mohammed, sort of discover the evidence in in real time and he's he's talking about how he self-funded this 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 sort of scholarship but he he sort of has the, this a couple of moments where he looks at the evidence and says oh my god i think that they really let two innocent men be convicted of this T take us inside those moments sure well first of all you know one of the interesting things about this process for us and for abdul rahman muhammad who was our kind of citizen sleuth, um, a man who's devoted the last several decades of his life to this story and this case, is that we began by looking at who actually killed Malcolm X with the idea that the killer or the shotgun assassin in particular could still be alive and at large. But over time, as our investigation deepened, and actually once that shotgun assassin passed away, um, we began to really focus on who didn't kill Malcolm and on the possibility that um, innocent men had been convicted. And so a lot of what you see in the documentary is real. I mean, Abdul Rahman was beginning to really um, piece together um, evidence that pointed to the innocence of Muhammad Aziz and Khalil Islam. Um, one scene in particular is um, FBI documents um, that he did not know about until um, deep into the filming of the documentary, um, in which uh, a gentleman named Leon Amir um, had evidently told the FBI that he had been told that the guys who actually killed Malcolm were from Newark, not from Harlem, um, although four of the guys were, who were convicted were from Harlem, and that one of them was lieutenant in the Newark mosque. And he described him as dark-skinned and burly. Um, and in the FBI documents, um, there is evidence, uh, reports, identifying a gentleman in Newark um, who we came to know as Mustafa El Shabazz, um, as being a lieutenant in the Newark mosque, burly, all the rest of it. And these documents were just ignored. Um, so they, no, they didn't go anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, so the scene in which Abdur Rahman is for the first time seeing these documents, realizing that the FBI had this information pointing to a lieutenant in the Newark mosque, identifying him by name, just blew him away. Yeah. Um, and it blows the audience away watching it. it, it it's a powerful scene. Shayla, um, just talk a bit more about sort of this being an open secret, the idea that a number of people did, thought that these two men were innocent. But I also wonder if you could talk a little bit about the power of journalism. I know I'm familiar with your work before this documentary. You've been in journalism for a long time. Um, talk a little bit about the power of, of what it means that you were able to, uh, a UN as well as the, the rest of the team here, as well as multiple journalists. I, I read the Manning Marvel book when it came out, and of course, Les Payne and, and, and Tamara, Payne's book, The Power of Journalism to Really Shine a Light Still on Injustices. Yeah, no, for someone like me who's been steeped in journalism for my entire career and certainly was very familiar with the life and work of Malcolm X um, to work on um, a story that um, is concerned with the central question of his death. Um, you know, his life was so impactful and 
certainly the circumstances around his death often also reflect a lot of the questions that we continue to have about justice, about surveillance, about um, political extremism and um, religious activism. And, and so um, for us to be able to work on a story like this was really um, just life-changing for sure. And I think certainly all of the skills that, um, you know, our team has as a journalist, um, as, as reporters to really follow in the footsteps of some of the folks who had gone before, but to re-report and to reconfirm um, a lot of the stuff and try to get um, primary um, documents and primary witnesses to sort of um, get at this question was um, was a lot of the work that we did. And, and I think at the end of the day, you know, the sort of the biggest question was, you know, was this mere incompetence on the on the part of um, the police or was there something more nefarious? And I'm not sure as journalists, it's really our place to sort of make um, a draw a conclusion, but certainly to present that information in a way that's accessible, accessible to a larger audience who may not understand that, but certainly need to be aware of the history of an incredibly important and, and profound um, person in American history. Um, you know, it, it, it's just, um, there are no words um, for being able to, to have that kind of impact. Yeah, and Tamara, um, last question to you. Just talk a bit about what Malcolm X, this civil rights icon, this sort of person who was so, I think, blunt and clear-eyed about how this world could change when it comes to human rights, but also the state of, of Black people. What would he think about the world now? You you spent so much time talking to people who knew him. I wonder what you would, what he would say, one, about the fact that these men have been exonerated through a criminal justice system that is flawed, but also we're living through this inflection point where, where, where we're still debating about race and, and the access that Black people in particular have to the American dream. Right. Um, well, I mean, he talked about it strenuously, you know, when he was alive and a lot that we are discussing today, he was talking about back then. And when we talk about things like real estate issues, bank, banks and stuff, that these were issues that were going on back then, um, buying a house wherever you want. I mean, he was he was talking about those problems back then. So he wouldn't have he wouldn't have anything happy or optimistic to say, I would think, about the continuation of this. But he would be looking more to how we can attack this problem. And he would have some really good ideas. He had an economics idea. And part of that was about for African Americans to join up, having their relationship with Africans on the continent and having the, the, the African diaspora connect up um, and understand that the problems of African Americans in America is also connected to Africans in Nigeria and in Ghana. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you so much to all of you. We'll have to leave it there tonight. Thank you to Rachel, Shayla, Tamara, and Ryan for joining us and sharing your reporting. And thank you for joining us. Make sure to sign up for the Washington Week newsletter on our website. We will give you a look at all things Washington. I'm Yami Shalsendor. Good night.